Hi, everybody. My name is Stevie B. I'm a recovering drug addict, and um, great to be here with you guys tonight. My home group is in Alcoholics Anonymous. Hi, it's the Golden Hi, Texas. Hi, Thank you very much. Uh, I, as I came in here tonight, I, I knew that there was going to be a lot of drug addicts, and I thought it was going to be wild, right? I thought it was going to be wild. But you guys are very, very, you know, very uh, reserved, and um, and I and and I, I, you, you you can let go. I mean, we're we're gonna it's o it's okay, you know. There, there's only been one woman that was twerking. It was one of uh, Tina's uh, sponsees. Uh, as opposed to the last time I was here six months ago at the Young, young People's Conference, there was twerking. There was things I'd never seen before, to be honest with you. So I'm still recovering from that. Any, anyway, um, uh, we are here from Florida. I am originally from New York, and, um, and I've been in... Um, this is my first time in Drug Addicts Anonymous, so I, I, I want to be honest about this. My first time being, and I'm and I'm already uh, really enjoying the experience, and um, and I and I'm enjoying that I'm going to get to actually say uh, what actually happened, um, uh, because even though I'm, I, I am a proud member of, what's that? Yeah, and I and I feel free. I feel free. I I, I didn't really wear any undergarments, and. Um, <laughs> Because I, I'm just going to just let, let you have it. <laughs> um, but, but I, I originally, um, well, I don't think it's in, as important as what I did as, uh, as what happened. Um, so I am going to share uh, my experience, strength, and hope in that arena. And, uh, and hopefully you'll identify not what the drugs or, or whether it's alcohol or drugs. I hope you're going to identify why I needed to use and, and, the, and the feeling that I had, even before, way before I ever took any type of substance, uh, was the feeling that I needed to have a substance. And that uh, I never really felt like I fit in at any place that I was ever at. And I always had this hole inside me, it, whether it was anxiety, um, I'm half Jewish and I'm half Italian. That's not going to be very popular in this part of the country. But, but I, what I want to explain to you is, what I, what I wanna, is there any Jewish people here? No, of course not. Um, uh, Mikey, are you? Are you, Mikey? Really? That's so cool. And my sponsor's here, so there's two or three of us. That's great. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. It's in the back. Okay, great. All right. Awesome. So four of us. That's wonderful. And um, so, but what I want to tell you is that uh, it, I never felt like I fit in anywhere. So I didn't feel like I fit in to the Christian side of my family, the Italian side of my family, and I didn't feel like I fit into the Jewish side of my family, and I just didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. And I, I call that the disease of addiction. The, uh, I, I usually call it the disease of alcoholism, but this, this, it's the disease of addiction. It's the disease that when I'm, I'm, I'm around people that tell me that they love me, like my parents, they told me they loved me, and yet I didn't feel it. I felt like I was adopted. I felt like I was from a different family. I, I knew they loved my sister. And I, I'm going to tell you, it's such an incredible... Ooh, I just got goosebumps just now. God is definitely going to be all over this meeting, I want to tell you, and I want you to know he's here right now. So yeah, yeah. I, I just had goosebumps going, came all over me because something that just happened. I, I've been in uh, the programs uh, for over 30 years, um, and something just happened in the last week and a half. I haven't even been able to share it with my sponsor yet. That, that showed me just how skewed or off my perception was, um, and that I'm going to get to share about it every time. And it actually is going to be the first time that I ever shared it in public, so that's, that's going to be pretty neat. From Long Island, New York which is the Northeast, which is, uh, if you're from New York and, and you're from Long Island, New York, you think the entire world centers around Long Island, New York. You think that everything else is a, is a suburb of Long Island, New York. We're, we're, we're very, uh, set. there's Jersey people here, uh, people who are from Jersey, so you know, you, you understand. It's the same thing, Jersey, New York. We have a rivalry. You couldn't tell us the difference in an Italian restaurant, but we always, we, we, we feel like we're, we're, we're from a different planet. And um, in, in, in my school uh, district, and in my, in my neighborhood, in my blocks, where I'm from in New York, there, and I'm going to tell you some stories. Like my sponsor says, I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff. None of it's going to make any sense. But at the end, it's all going to come together like the movie Pulp Fiction. And you're going to be like, oh, okay, I got it. I, now I see. Now I see what he was doing like 45 minutes ago. Oh, okay. It all, it's all going to come together. So in my neighborhood, uh, everything was separated by blocks. And on my block, it just so happens everyone in my block had big brothers. 
Uh, they had two or three big brothers. And those that had big brothers on my block, when they would come to the playground, they would come with their big brothers. That's where you, they would have the juice or they would have the respect. They would come with their big brothers. And I had a little chubby sister. And so when I would come to the net, I would hold her hand. I love her. I love her. She's my best friend. We're still best friends. And, but you get no juice. Where, where I'm from, if you don't have a big brother and you have a little chubby sister, you get no juice on the playground. You get no backing up. You know, someone punches you, you you're not going to look to your little sister to back you up. So I always felt like some of the angst that I had, some of the uh, bad feelings that I had, uh, was because um, I was the only kid in my neighborhood that didn't have any big brothers. Um, so I, I just tell a little story about that. So just to se- show you that I wanted to be anybody else other than me. And I knew if I was somebody else, I'd probably have a better shot at a better life. I don't know if you can, understand, if you can relate to that. So I'm, I'm in, I'm in uh, grade school. I'm in the seventh grade or sixth grade, 12, 13 years old. And we get a new coach that came to, to a town. My last name is Boyarski, Mike. And um, they said, uh, uh, Boyarski. They get to me. The new coach says, Boyarski. And I said, yes, coach. And he says, uh, does your brother play for the Pittsburgh Panthers? Now, that's a very simple answer if you don't have a big brother or if your brother doesn't play for the Pittsburgh Panthers. But right there, I knew my entire life was about to change. And I said, yes, he does, coach. Yes, he does. Now, all my friends that have known me my entire life and knew I had a stepbrother that was a plumber from Massachusetts, they knew that I didn't have a brother that played for the Pittsburgh Panthers. And they all looked at me. But at that moment, I made a decision. It was either going to be that story or I was going to go back to the nobody that I was two seconds ago. I don't know if you can relate to that, but I, I was ready to do anything to not be a, a nobody to, to possibly be a somebody. And I started making that up. And I started wearing the, that guy's jersey. Sometimes I tell the story and I started saying my brother's jersey. That's still in me 40 years later. I started wearing Jerry Boyarski's jersey. And I had newspaper clippings. And, I had, and, and when, when he got dra- drafted into the NFL, that was a big day for me. That was a huge day. <laughs> that was a huge day. Everybody was congratulating me and high-fiving me. And my mother was like, why, is it, why are you making such a big... Why are you wearing that guy's jersey just because it's the same last name? And I could never tell her. But later on, she found, news, she found all these uh, scrapbooks that I had with my brother written in it and big... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to be anybody other than myself in my life. And I, I want you to know that I've been doing... Um, uh, I'd attic things before I picked up my first uh, drug. I've been doing behavior that was already, um, I'd like to say alcoholic or, 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 or an addict, that was way before I ever had my first substance. The, the disease that I have is a disease of more, but it's also a disease of loneliness. That's why I love these type of things. The hugging, the, the camaraderie, the high-fiving, the... The, 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 um, I got to meet uh, these, I, I don't know if you guys know George and Tina uh, from, I think it's Wabasha. <laughs> What's that called? Anyway, I met them here in Wisconsin. And, um, and, and the last conference I was at, my, my dear friend Andre, who I just got to meet because my sponsor had COVID. Uh, that's here, Russell Spatz is here tonight. And uh, he had COVID, so I filled in for him. And the way that George and Tina made me feel, just meeting them once, taking me around and, 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 and showing me uh, different places and Andre taking me all through uh, Wisconsin and, and Milwaukee and, and buying me breakfast. You know, these are friendships that, that, that I've always looked for and always try to be somebody else to get in, and in DAA or, or whatever program that you're in, DAA, I'm going to use that for tonight. Um, you don't have to be anybody other than yourself. I came here, my only qualification was that to meet George and Tina and all these incredible people, Allie and all of them, and Henry that invited me here today. And I, first of all, I, I, I would be remiss to say thank you to the host committee. You guys have done such a great job. It's an incredible thing that you guys are, that want to do, um, that to, to, to make a program that you could uh, use the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is magical, I just want to share it with you, and, and, and be able to say drugs and, and whatever your narcotics is. I, I think that's incredible, Alex, Mike, Henry, this whole team. Can we give these guys a round of applause, please? <laughs> I've always wanted to say this word, crack, so I'm just going to get it out of the way right now, and I just said <laughs> Thank you. I've, I've, I've been holding that back for 25 years. <laughs> Woo! 
I'm not sure how it's going to go in the story, but I just needed to shout it. Um, so they made me feel so welcome last time. I couldn't wait to get back to be here with you guys. And that's what's the incredible thing about the Anonymous's program. You're going to be loved for exactly who you are, not who you made up in school, not who you made up at the bar, not who you made up at the drug house. You could be exactly who you are and people are going to love you for exactly, you don't have to pretend anymore. You, you're out of the closet, you're out of the house, you're out of everything. This is your home. And I was searching for that my whole life. And so I thought, I thought that uh, being the toughest guy in my neighborhood or being a tough guy, I'm not saying I was ever the toughest, but being a tough guy, being a mobster wannabe, uh, that that was going to gain me respect in my neighborhood. And, um, and, and it couldn't be further from the truth. It, that that the, the heart condition that I have can only be healed by not by bravado and by pretending I'm a gangster, but by telling you how vulnerable I am and, and, and praying with you and hugging with you. So I, I just think this is the most incredible thing that, I, that I'm a member of because I did drugs. You know, it's like... Like, like, I did drugs, and I get to be with you guys. It's the most incredible thing. I, I think, I mean, that's the greatest thing. How'd you get here? We did drugs. Okay, great. That's amazing. That's amazing. And what a good group, of, good looking group of people we are. Well, we, we, we suit up, we show up, we, we, we look great, and we come together and, and things like this, and, and uh, great on the Narcan, great on the, the, the whole thing. So I was doing alcoholic addict things, uh, before I ever had my first drink, and, and, I, and, I, and I wanted to hang out with this guy in my neighborhood, uh, Kevin. He was, like, tough. In, in my age group, he was the toughest, and he had big brothers. Like I told you, the Wagamans, the Mungners, the, the, the Matas, the, the, all these guys, they all had big brothers. But, but in this one family, um, he was the toughest kid in my neighborhood, and I wanted to hang out with him. But I knew that he wouldn't want to hang out with me because I didn't have in anything inertly inside me that I would think that anyone that was cool wanted to hang out with me. But my dad, who was a Korean War veteran, uh, a war hero actually, who just passed away uh, one year ago this month, uh, may God rest his soul, my dad Stan, uh, he had guns. And so we had guns. And in my neighborhood, that's not Tennessee, totally, no, you know, I get you guys have guns. But, <laughs> but, but in Long Island, New York, unless you're in the mob or a police officer, you don't just walk around with guns. But we had guns. So that was pretty cool in my neighborhood. And so I went up to Kevin and I said, would you, um, well, what I said to him, you know, back in the day, we'd say, would you like to come out and play with me? So obviously you can't say that today, Henry, though you get arrested. So, <laughs> so I said, would you like to, I said that, but it really, it translates to, would you like to hang out with me? And so I, I, he goes, why would I want to hang out with you? And I said, because I have guns and we can blow stuff up and that's cool. So my guns were cool. My drugs would later be cool. My car would be cool. My money would be cool. I was never enough for any relationship I was ever in before I came into the program. I was never enough. I was always left wanting. If I didn't have my bag, my satchel of stuff, if I didn't have my car, if I didn't give you my ATM card, if I didn't give you money, if I didn't have the purest cocaine, I knew you wouldn't want to hang out with me. So... I, um, so he came over to the house and we we're blowing stuff up and then he got bored and he was going to leave and I didn't want him to leave at any cost because for that half an hour or an hour, whatever it was, I was only 12, 13, I was like on top of the world because you can feel me temporarily. Stuff, I've always been looking for outside stuff to fill this God-sized hole. And it, and it works momentarily. A hit works, a drink works, a relationship works, sex works. You know, for, for, for that moment. And so he started to leave. And then, and then I started to feel the feelings again of, of awkwardness and loneliness. And I, and I said, don't leave. And this turns out to be a pattern over my life that I'm willing to forego what's anything logical or anything intelligent for the moment that's in emotion. To, and I'll just do it so that you don't leave me. And I said to Kevin, you could shoot at me. And we'll play a game called shoot at me. Yeah. <laughs> I made it up on the spot. <laughs> and a one in a million shot, one in a million chance, one in a million bullet, one in a million all of it, he shot me and it went right into my right eye and blew out my right eye. And while I was laying there on the grass, 
and blood was coming out of my eye. And my little sister is looking over me, and she's crying. All I could do is think about Kevin and how the people in the school would know that he did it and that he would never want to hang out with me again. And for like 20 or 30 years, I always told people that it was a ricochet and that I never would admit that he did it because I didn't want to be uncool because I still wanted to have Kevin as my friend. It was, it was more important for me to have that than tell the truth. And I carried that around for, for years and years and years. And I tell you that story is I never had a drink at that point. I had never had a drug at that point. And I was doing things that were totally ridiculous, uncalled for, illogical, because in the moment, I can make any of those decisions, and I can still make those decisions today. I want you to know, inside me is good Stevie and bad Stevie. Who I feed wins, and who I starve dies. Right now, I'm feeling spiritual, on top of the world. I mean, I did go to the second floor by accident, and that, that, that was shocking. <laughs> That was a mistake. <laughs> but other than that, I'm feeling very spiritual. And uh, because I'm feeding good Steve. I'm feeding good Stevie tonight. I, I have love from you guys. I feel the love. I love being here. I love the programs. I love, I love being in a new program that I've never... I'm excited about going to a meeting of DAA in, in, in Florida. I'm excited about the whole, the whole prospect. But then there's a, there's, a, there's a bad Stevie inside. I can't wait to hear Chris Raymer. My whole life I've wanted to meet him. I just got to meet him tonight. He's speaking tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. or 10.30. That's going to be a big deal. But bad Stevie wants to come out. He's gnawing out. He's, he's down there and he's like, you've never been in this city before, in this part of the city. When everyone goes to bed tonight, I'm sure there's bad things we can do. <laughs> And he's to having a meeting with other addicts inside my head, and I'm not invited. <laughs> and they're trying to cause mayhem right now as I'm speaking. It's like, yeah, that's a great idea. Don't tell the other guys. <laughs> and if you have that thing going on in, my, in your mind, if you have those different committees, my, my sponsor says a committee and a subcommittee, and, the, and nobody's meeting, and I mean, everyone's meeting, and no one's telling you. <laughs> if you have that, you know we need this. We need this. We need this. This centers us. And I needed this. And now I'm 12 or 13 years old and I have one eye and I'm the kid that everyone says, hey, you know, don't play with guns. Yeah. <laughs> and like all the parents are like, hey, Stevie, could you come over here? Don't do that. Don't do that. And, and still up to this point, I, and you know, I, and I loved it, by the way. I loved it. I went around with an eye patch. I loved it. Because anything for attention. I have, a, I have a ego, I'm an egomaniac uh, with an inferiority complex, and it's better to be made fun of than not be talked about at all. It's better to be mentioned than not to be mentioned, is what I'm saying, not to be made fun of. I don't like to be made fun of, of course. <laughs> but it's better to be mentioned than not to be mentioned. And I knew I would never do drugs. I would, knew I would never be one of those guys that did that stuff, but the feeling inside me, the low self-esteem, was so horrible that the moment that I had, uh, in, in, um, in Jewish families, we have something called Manischewitz Jewish table wine. It's like, it's like grape juice with alcohol in it. It's a very, very cool thing to have. And, um, <laughs> and uh, sort of like during Passover meals and different things like that, they, 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 you get to try that, and I tried that, and I loved it. I was like, this is awesome. And my grandfather, being full Italian, my grandfather had a big Italian bar downstairs, and I, and I would I'd have little drinks on a Sunday. And, and Sunday for me was the, was the moment of serenity. We'd finish the Italian meal. I'd go downstairs. I'd be with my little sister. We'd be watching TV. My grandfather had a TV with a remote. That was a big deal in our neighborhood. And we'd be watching TV, and I would be drinking all the different fancy liqueurs, from my grandfather's bar, and each one I would take just a little sip. I didn't drink alcoholically, but a little sip, little sip, little sip. I didn't drink like an addict, little sip, little sip, little sip, and I loved it. And everything was fine. And I, I didn't need to, listen, there's nothing that works better for me than one, one of anything. I just got to share something with you. One of anything works phenomenal for me, okay? Well, almost anything. I don't want to say that. But one drink, one little puff of a joint, that I, I'm good. I'm good to go. I, I, to be honest with you, there's nothing that works faster for me than a, than a drink to just calm my nerves. 
It's, it's every other drink after that that I have the problem with. It's every other hit after that that I have the problem with. Um, so, um, so the drink is working for a little while, and I'm getting through high school, and everything's good, and, and, um, and I can't, pay, can't play sports anymore because of the one-eye situation, but I'm still doing fine with the girls. Everything's fine. <laughs> and, uh, and, then I, and then marijuana comes in, and, and, um, and that was great. I, I, I loved that time of my life, and, and uh, stole a, um, you know, a scale from the, from the uh, science department. So that was great. I started my first business. That was awesome. <laughs> And, uh, and, and everything's going fine. There's like no big deals. I'm like a great, I'm a great straight C student. I'm, I'm just getting by. I'm like right in the middle of the class, 2,500 kids. I'm like 1,250. I'm like right in the middle. I'm getting by. I'm shooting for the stars. I'm getting high. I'm drinking a little bit at school. Everything is just fine. And, uh, but I'm a product of New York, and I'm a product of the 80s. Uh, 70s and 80s. So, and so this, during this time is when New Jack City, the movie, came out. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I had snuck into college. I, and like, a lot of you guys went to college and you got accepted into college. I snuck into college. I went through the back door. I, like, showed up and they're like, who are you? And I said, I'm not leaving. And I was, at, I was able to stay in college. And so I was in college. And I went home for a, um, a, a Sunday dinner with my grandfather, JC, and he was reading the paper, and, and he said this. He goes, uh, Stevie. I go, yes, Grandpa. He goes, uh, there's, a new, there's, a sub, there's, a, there's, a, there's a drug out, and it's all over the city, and it's called crack. And he said, and if you ever try it, you'll become addicted instantaneously. And I said... Whoa, that sounds terrible, Grandpa. Let me, let me see that paper for a second. <laughs> and I went and I took that paper to Manhattan and I was like on the... Has anybody seen this substance? <laughs> Does anybody know where I can get this? I mean, if you tell me I'm going to get instantly addicted to something, are you kidding me? I'm not thinking I'm going to get instantly addicted, but I know that that's some good stuff. <laughs> And I took that newspaper and I went right to Manhattan and I went right to something called Washington Heights. And I went right underneath the George Washington Bridge and I was like, Let, can I get some of this? And they were like, yes. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> and that was it. And I was in college and I was on the president's committee and I was the president of my fraternity. And I went from all of that to underneath the stairs in my fraternity house, and I didn't come out for two semesters. When I came out, everyone had graduated. I would only come out at night. That's a true story. I think, that, I think there's a song, but I, that's a true story. And I was a guy that would do a little bit of cocaine in college, because you, you, really, you really can't uh, do a lot of cocaine if you don't have money. And I was a waiter. I was, I was like one of those waiters at the uh, destination resorts where like Dirty Dancing where they pay you at the end of the week. And so I would get the cocaine at the end of the week. And, but that was not really a big deal. And then this happened. But still, but still, I, it wasn't that big of a deal because I didn't have any money. Um, but uh, my uncle, uh, who is a very successful uh, doctor in South Florida, uh, one of the chief internists in, in the area where from, very well-known person, just the coolest guy, and he had a mansion on the water, and, and um, he had a Jaguar when nobody had a Jaguar. He was a genius. He taught himself how to be a doctor in Italian while he was in Italy, and he didn't speak Italian. So at the same time, he was learning Italian, and he was in medical school at the same time. You would have loved him, Russell. Just an incredible guy. And uh, he had this disease. He had this disease. He had this dis-ease. And he died on the bottom of his swimming pool, uh, alone with a couple waiters from uh, Ruth Chris Steakhouse and, um, because he had the disease of also the loneliness disease and the money and the, and the doctorates and, and his office and, 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 and the pool and the house on the water, that wasn't enough and he died alone on the, on the bottom of a swimming pool. And so at that moment, my Uncle JJ uh, left me all his money and so now I'm in college and I had just tried crack. And crack is expensive. It doesn't seem it. It seems like it's like... It doesn't seem like it really will work out like that, but it does work out like that. It seems like a bargain at first, right? It seems like a bargain. You know what I'm saying, Henry, right? It seems like a bargain. That, that's not a lot, but yeah, yeah, it is. Don't try the first one. And so, um, so, but now I have money. And so now it gets really, really bad until I run out of the money. And I don't know about you, but I never have a problem when I have money. It's when the money runs out, I'm like, I really have a problem. This is, serious. This is some serious business. 
this, this, this could be a problem. And so um, I'm 21 years old. I'm 20, I'm sorry, I'm 20 years old. And, and I run out of money. And I'm in uh, Pennsylvania. And, um, and, uh, and on the way home from this resort, I get hit by a deer. And, um, and, and, I, and I take the side of the car out. And I call my parents and I say, listen, I just hit a deer. I take the side of the car out. And, uh, and I'm not going to be able to finish school. I'm not going to be able to be a waiter here at this, at this uh, you know, great resort that I work if I don't get the car fixed. And they're like, we totally understand. And they wired me the money. Well, however, they did money back 35 years ago. They wired me the money. And subsequently, I was hitting a deer every week, weekly. Weekly deer. <laughs> weekly. It was a very big problem I had. Very big problem. And so I hit a deer every single week. And by the time I came home and told my parents that I was a drug addict, which is what I had, had to do, um, they were kind of relieved because they just thought I had, like, lost my mind. <laughs> and, and they did not know I was a drug addict. So I don't know if that had... That's, that, when I came home and said, I'm addicted to cocaine, they were shocked. They, they, they knew something was wrong. They knew I couldn't keep money in the house. They knew I, that, 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 that I was lying about the, the, uh, the deer every single week. Um, but they were shocked. And they did not see it coming. We didn't have drug addicts in my family, nor did we think that my uncle had died of alcoholism. After I came into the program, we started to have the discussion. So I'm 20 years old. We don't know what to do with me. I'm a drug addict that, that just got kicked out of school in his last semester. I go home, and back then, you know, treatment wasn't like something everybody did. It's not like the fourth option. You know, like, like now you have college, you have a job, you have maybe the military and treatment. It wasn't like that back then. It, you know, it, it wasn't like the fourth option. It was like not everybody was going to treatment. So I came home and, and my parents said, well, we know about a guy that was in our family who had went to Center City, Minnesota to go to treatment. And, and, I, and I know I should know this. I know I should know this, but I didn't know where Minnesota was technically. I knew it was west of Pennsylvania. So technically, I knew it was west of Pennsylvania. I, I had really just experienced um, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, of course, um, and, then, um, and then Florida, because we all go to spring break for Florida. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the United States, the four states. <laughs> and everything else I knew was here, because I learned it also. Uh, but I just didn't know exactly where the middle of the country was. I know it was out here somewhere. And so uh, my mother says to me, listen, you're going to treatment. And I go, okay, well, what is that? And she, and she gets me the VHS tape, and are you okay? You you good? Okay, good. Okay, good. Because I was going to use the... Or, you all right? Okay. Because uh, you people are laughing. I was just checking. Um, we got the Narcan like four people down. Okay. <laughs> and so they put the VHS tape in at, of, of 28 days, 28 days clean and sober with Michael Keaton. I've never seen anything like this. They, it describes treatment. The guy, the guy goes to treatment. There's dances. There's a lake. There's a boat. There's milkshakes. I'm in. I'm in. Because I'm a spring break type of guy. I love relationships. I like meeting people. I like dancing. And the whole thing looked like a great time. And so I did what I always do. Um, uh, while I was drinking, I was, I was allowed to drink. We didn't really equate alcohol with any... With, we never saw alcohol as a drug. We never saw that in my family. I didn't see alcohol as a drug. And so I was allowed to drink while watching the movie. And, um, and then they... It's a true story. I mean, that, it happened just like this. And, um, and then I packed. I packed like I always do for any trip that I ever took, which was only spring break in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale. So I packed the same way I always do. I have my, my, my guinea teas, uh, my five gold chains, my Italian chains, a lot of hair drill. I always travel with a lot of hair drill. My muscle pants. My muscle pants were short, basically pajamas for adults. And, and, uh, and a windbreaker jacket, you know, like the last uh, members, the members only jacket. And, and, I, and I head out to Minnesota, which not knowing really where it is, but I'm, I'm like spring break bound, and it's February 7th, and uh, yeah, 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 apparently you understand what I'm talking about. So I don't know anything about this type of cold. I was in Pennsylvania and New York, but Minnesota cold, and I, there was nobody from Minnesota here, but I, I know you know what Minnesota cold is. You guys have cold here. I was here during the January. Um, it wasn't that bad, though, when I was here. It was very, very nice. But back 30 years ago in Minnesota, it was negative 45 when I landed. And, uh, and that's shocking. Okay, that's shocking. That's shocking if you're in a T-shirt and, and pajama pants and, and gold chains. That's shocking. And, like, my, my chest hair is just frozen solid. You know? Whew. 
and, and the guy from Hazelden, the guy, I, I didn't go to Hazelden main campus. I went to Hazelden Young People's uh, in Plymouth, Minnesota, and they, and they came and they picked me up and they brought me to the, to the treatment center, and that's when I saw the steps for the first time. I had seen the movie, and, and they talked about the four step, but I'd never actually seen the 12 steps, and it's the first time I saw the 12 steps. And the 12 steps, say, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, okay, not our 12 steps. Uh, DAA, but uh, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous has the word alcohol in it, like right off the bat. It says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. And I knew I wasn't powerless over alcohol. I'm, I'm 20 years old. I didn't even really start drinking. I mean, I drank in college, but it wasn't like a situation. I, I'm there because I have a, a problem with one substance and one substance only, and it's, and it's definitely cocaine. It's definitely not drinking. So I, I, and my father was a big deal in, in hotels in Atlantic City. He was like a uh, like, um, my, my father was connected in Atlantic City, so we were in a lot of hotels, okay? If you know what I'm saying, like, we, we would be hotel guests, limousine type of t- type people. So I was used to hotels. So I said to the guy, excuse me, concierge, there, there's, a, uh, there's, a tw- there's alcohol here, and I'm not here for alcohol. I'm not here for no alcohol. I'm, I'm just 20. I'm here for one substance and one substance only, and, uh, and I'm not going to stop drinking. He said, well, we don't drink here. I said, I'm not going to drink in the center. But I'm not ever going to, st- I'm not here to stop drinking. I was told that this could get me off cocaine and that you guys were the top program for uh, people under 21 and that I could leave here. I'm going to finish college. I'm in the last semester and, and I think I'll be good to go. This is a 20, I'm going to do the 28 days just like the movie and I'm going to go back and every, I think everything's going to work out. And, and he said, well, you could leave. And, and I'm from New York, you know, so like, don't call my bluff. So I, I, I like looked at my three piece matching Gucci luggage and I picked it up and, and I told him, well, I'm going to leave, you know, because that's what we do from the Northeast. If you don't like something, you just raise your voice and hope it works out. So, so I said, I'm going to leave and I'm going to take my $35,000 check from Stan Boyarski, which is my dad's name. And, and back in the Northeast, that carried a lot of weight. In Minnesota, nobody really cared who your father was. And he's like, well, then you could leave. And I go, well, I am going to leave. And, I, and, I was good, and, I, and I'm going to pull this thing, king baby thing that I've done my whole life. And I'm going to shout and I'm going to kick and scream and I'm going to leave. But you're not leaving at nighttime in Minnesota in the middle of the winter uh, because it's like Fargo. I don't know if you've ever seen that, the movie. And, and, the, and, and a snow drift had one in front of the door and it was like The Shining and nobody was getting out of that place. <laughs> So you, I couldn't leave. And, and I tell you that story because it doesn't matter why we're here. We could be wife ordered, court ordered, police ordered, husband, parent ordered. It does not matter why you're here. We have made it. We have arrived. We never have to use no matter what, even if we want to. I, I, when I was listening to Tina's story a couple months ago, I think she came in when she was 16, 17, 18. She's never picked up since. We never have to pick up ever again. We are off the hook. I want you to receive that, what I'm saying. We are off the hook. No matter what happens, one day at a time for the rest of our lives. And things are going to happen. And their disappointments are going to happen. And, and, and tough times are going to come. But we never have to pick up. We have this fellowship. And we have the people around us. We have our sponsors. We have the steps. We have prayer. We have our Lord. We have the whole entire thing that will get us through. And I I didn't know that as a 20-year-old kid in that treatment center, but uh, magical things were about to happen. Incredible things were about to happen. And the reason I say that in this part of the story is because I only stayed in Alcoholics Anonymous because it was Alcoholics Anonymous that I came into because that's what they had at that treatment center is because it was freezing outside. I didn't stay because I wanted to. I I was waiting for it to thaw. And I stayed and they started to take me around to meetings. And the guy comes out and he goes, I, I, I realize nobody's here from Minneapolis, so it's not going to be a big deal for you. But the guy says, listen, we're going to take you to the oldest clubhouse in Minneapolis tomorrow. It's called 2218. And, 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 and he expected me like, to be excited about it. Like, like, <laughs> like, I'm like my cousin Vinny coming off the plane with like gold chains. And he's like, take, we're going to take you to the oldest clubhouse in Minneapolis. I'm like, I, what? You know, What? <laughs> He takes me to this, to, to, like the place you took me to, Andre, in, in Milwaukee, which was so cool. Um, it was cool, but it wasn't cool to me. I didn't want anything, but I didn't want any part of it. And you may be here tonight thinking, this is so uncool. I'm going to tell you, stick around. It's about to become very cool. We have, um, uh, is Brandon here? Is Brandon still here tonight? Brandon, stay for the talk? No? Um, Brandon, are you here from the halfway house? No? Okay. Well, 
I would, like I was telling some of the guys, we get to do these conventions. We get to travel together. We get to go places. I've been around the world with Alcoholics Anonymous and now the DAA. Um, all different places I've gotten to speak in. All different, all different uh, walks of life. And, and it's always the same thing. It's always the same. Like I, I, I can rest assured. I'm, I'm not going to say guarantee. But I feel like Mikey P and myself will be friends the rest of my life. That's the way I feel. I'm not sure how he feels. I'll talk to him later. <laughs> but I just met the guy and we're like smooshing on each other and this is amazing and, and big book and the whole thing. And, 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 th and that's, yeah, where were you? What's wrong with you? Didn't you hear me call your name? I got one eye. Why are you picking on me? <laughs> Chris, can you believe this kind of nonsense? I shouted his name and he said, how many Brandons from halfway houses are here? Raise your hand. <laughs> oh, two of you? Great. Anyway, so I stayed. I had a, I had a whole plan. I was going to leave in the, I was going to leave in the spring. I, I, I met, I met a, this beautiful. I met, I met girls in Narcotics Anonymous, which was the program that I landed in, because that's where the girls were in Minneapolis at the time. And I'm definitely a heat-seeking missile, and I'll do what I can to get what you have. You definitely want what you have. I'm willing to go to any late to get it. I'm going to tell you that much. So it didn't really matter which program I was in as long as you were there. And, uh, and I didn't work any of the steps. And I stayed clean for 18 months. And then someone approached me and they said, um, you know, that they had drugs. My drug of choice, which was crack. And wow, that felt good. And, um, and, they, and they said they had a crack problem. And I hadn't met anyone in Minneapolis that even said that word. And once they said that, I had no, I had no defense against the first hit. I had not worked the steps. I did not develop a relationship with God. I had developed a relationship with meetings and with girls and with a, with a sponsor, but no relationship with you guys, no relationship with the steps, no relationship with the power greater than myself, no relationship with God. I wasn't praying on my knees in the morning. I wasn't praying on my knees at night. So when someone said I had a problem with crack, I said I have $200. It was like that after 18 months. <laughs> after 18 months, I had no mental defense because I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared because I didn't understand the concept of relapse. I thought you come in, you go to, you go to treatment, and then you're, you're clean for the rest of your life one day at a time. That's what I, and then we had slogans, you know, not today. And so, I, you know, I, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> and then here I am, I'm, 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 I, I, now I don't have daddy's money. Because my, my parents had joined a program called Naranon. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for you guys that just went, oh, poop, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know they joined Naranon, right? I call them up, I'm like, it's freezing out here. I'm like the most retarded addict. I always relapse in the winter in Minnesota. I never did. I mean, who does that? You get a relapse, do it in the, in, in the summer. It's beautiful there. But no, I, I, I picked like the dead of winter to, to relapse. And I, and I call my parents and said, I'm dying in the cold. And they said, I'm sorry, we didn't cause that. We can't cure it. We have no control over it. I'm like, what? What did you just say? <laughs> what, what are you? We're, we're practicing the three C's. I said, I'm freezing out here. They're like, I'm sorry. We, we're we're going to have to uh, have healthy boundaries from. And they gave me all this stuff. And I was like alone in Minnesota. And, and now I don't have daddy's money. And, and, and I have no insurance. And, and I'm strung out on drugs. And, and I'm strung out on NyQuil. I know this sounds crazy, but I'm just going to this is how it was. That was my drug of choice because they had, they had come out with a new store. It was a brand new store. It was called Target. It was in downtown Minneapolis. I know now we know what it is, but back then it was like pretty cutting edge. And I had a Target, I had a Target card. And you could go into Target and you could purchase NyQuil. And, and so I was walking around Minneapolis, walking in Minneapolis, walking in Minneapolis in the winter, <laughs> over, over snow drifts with a bottle of NyQuil, trying to uh, get hits of crack. And I, and I was just done, but there wasn't any uh, detoxes that would take me. So I went out to, um, to uh, Minnesota in the, in, the, in the area of uh, Native, where the Native Americans were. And uh, they have a Native American detox, but the, the key is you have to be Native American. And I was. I definitely was. I, I definitely was. And I, and I went there, and for three days I didn't speak, and they kept asking me, well, you know, what, yo, what tribe are you from? And I'm like, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> You know, eventually they figured out like I was not from the tribe of that area. Like I was from the tribe of New York. They, they got that and, and I was out. But I, 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 I got three good days of that because it was the only place that would take me. And, and I had went from a three-piece matching Gucci luggage to NyQuil 
in a Native American uh, <laughs> detox in Shakopee. I think it was called Shakopee. Yes. Oh my God. I mean, I was just in college and now I'm completely homeless and I'm lying about my, my, my race. <laughs> <laughs> and not very well, let me tell you, I want to tell you. you. You really should do research before you just go in and choose another race. <laughs> and, and so I'm stuck in Shakopee, and I, and I, and I had just pawned my car. And, and it got bad, real bad. And, and I called up my first sponsor by the name of Jerry Bear. A uh, tough Jew, Jewish guy from New York. And uh, he was living out there going to a meeting called the Central Pacific Group. It was a meeting uh, fashioned after uh, meetings out as the Pacific Group in California. They had one in Minneapolis called the Central Pacific Group. And uh, he told me, you're going to get on your knees and you're going to pray. Uh, and I'm like, I don't do that. And he's like, you're going to do it. He said, because Stevie, the, the disease of addiction is not like a flat-footed cop that walks around the streets of New York with a donut in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other. The disease of addiction is like a secret service agent that walks in and out of parties unnoticed, that speaks five languages, that knows how to use every weapon in the arsenal. And if you want to have any success or if you have any respect for your sobriety, for your recovery, then you better have more, just more respect for the disease of addiction. And you're going to get down on your knees in the morning and you're going to pray to God to keep you clean and sober. Because if you came over my house for Thanksgiving dinner and you sat at the table and you didn't say please for the food and then you got up from the table and you left the house and you didn't say thank you for the food, I would never invite you back again. So why do you think you should be in God's world one day without saying please for the gift of recovery that morning and thanking him for the gift of recovery at night? You have no gratitude. <laughs> And he said to me, that's why you relapse. That's why you keep picking up. It's not that you're a drug addict. You're selfish. You're self-centered. All you do is think about yourselves. All, and this is not a you program. This is you, you are going to need to clean house. You're going to need to trust God. And you're going to need to help others. And you haven't done any of that. And no wonder you picked up crack. So if you don't change something while you're here, you're going to die out here in the streets of Minneapolis with no money and improperly dressed. <laughs> And I started praying on my knees. And I got, into, I got into some really great groups. And you guys loved on me. The people in the program loved on me. And they took this wise, wise butt kid from, from New York that thought he had all the answers. And they put me on couches in different meeting rooms. You know how it is, Tina and George. They put you on couches and they take you to different meeting rooms and, and had me clean the ashtrays. I'm like, I don't smoke. They're like, shut up. <laughs> And, then, and we had coffee cups back then, uh, uh, porcelain coffee cups. And I had the coffee cup job, which was a big deal in the Central Pacific Group. And, and, uh, and, I, and I started, and I got time, and I got, a, and I got a year. And then I moved down to Florida because my grandfather invited me to come back in the family because uh, eventually, you know, people want you back. And so they invited me to back come from Florida. My, my grandfather moved from New York to down there, and, and I was in a business with him, and and things were good, and I was, I was going to meetings, and life was good, and Alcoholics Anonymous blessed me. That was the program I was in. That's the program I'm in, and blessed me, and, um, and, uh, and life was good. And, and, and I had this great sponsor by the name of Myron, the locksmith of Broward County, where I'm from, and may God rest his soul that just passed away with 45 years. He took me around, and he was intelligent, and the guys in the group were intelligent, and I loved all of them, and then I became intelligent. And I thought that I was smarter than the guys in the group because now I'm like four years clean and I have all the answers. And, and, and I'm working on the outside. My outside was amazing. I was in the gym every day. I'm all bulked up. Hey, hey, hey. And, uh, and, I, and I just kept working on the outside, working on the outside, not doing any inside work. And it doesn't matter how many years sober you were. I was 12 years sober and I gave a kid a gun and told him to shoot me. I was 12 years clean when I, I never had a drug and I was telling kids to shoot me. Doesn't matter how many years clean I have, if I'm not working the program uh, of the 12 steps, the 12 steps that comes out of the big book, if I'm not having a personal relationship with God that's from the big book, the creator of the universe, if I don't have that, I'm going to become as sick or sicker because alcohol is alcohol and drugs are actually the cure to my alcoholism unless God takes that place. So I didn't know that. So I'm, I'm, I'm walking around and I'm, I'm, I got big arms and I got a triple black Mustang Cobra and I'm parking in the handicap zone and I'm punching people in AA, literally punching people in AA because they're talking when my sponsor's talking. So I whack them. <laughs> That's a true story. I'm not exaggerating. That actually happened time and time again and people are inviting me not to come back. 
and then and then I'm on, and then I and then I see I see the answer to my problems. And she rides in on an elephant inside the circus. Yeah, yeah. I'm working in a mall where they have a full circle with elephants and tigers and lions. Russell, I don't know if you remember the Fort Lauderdale Swap Shop, and there she was. She had feathers, showgirl feathers. And I said, if I could get that, that's going to help me because I, I feel so insecure. And so I, I didn't use words like insecure. It's not like where I'm from, we go, hey, yo, Tony, you powerless? We don't talk like that. <laughs> so, but, but I just knew something was wrong and I knew she could fix it. And I was, like I said, I was willing to do anything I could. I wanted what she had. I was willing to do it to get it. And, and, I, and I pursued her. She was something I'd never seen before. She was from the country of, of Colombia. She's Latin, and, and she was on a trapeze, and it was all shiny and new, and I'd never seen anything like it. <laughs> and uh, so she finally, had, uh, you know, uh, uh, succumbed to marrying me. And, and, and we get married, and we have a big AA wedding. We have a big NA wedding. We have people come from all over the country, my counselors, everyone. You're doing so great, but I was dying inside because I'm seven years clean. Nobody knows I'm dying. Because on paper, Alex, on paper, I look amazing. On paper, I got the Colombian wife, I got great arms, I have full hair, my teeth are white, and I got some money in the bank, and I bought a home, and I'm dying inside, my, my, my inside is completely decaying as we speak, and she doesn't know it, she thinks she's got a great guy, because I'm... I'm trying to be a great guy, and I'm trying to hold it all together. And she doesn't know that alcoholism and drug addiction has totally returned and I haven't picked up yet, but I'm sicker than I even was before I went into treatment because now I'm years clean, and that's not going to help me, and nothing's going to help me, and she's not going to help me, and we're on our honeymoon, and we're in New Orleans. New Orleans, who's New Orleans? Yeah! And I didn't pick New Orleans because of the music. I picked it because I wanted to have chaos. And she didn't know she's from Columbia. So she's like, where are we going to go? And I said, we're going to go to New Orleans. And she goes, oh, great. I love jazz. And I go, great. But I really wanted to be next to chaos. So we got, a, uh, we got the hotel room right on Duval. Uh, not on Duval. Right on, you know, on the main street, right? Bourbon Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and so we got the hotel room right there. And, and I couldn't wait to get involved in. I tried to get her to drink. She was like 16 years sober. She, she wouldn't drink. And I thought, I really made a bad mistake marrying her. She's not going to be fun. She's not sober in AA, Tina. I didn't mean like that. I didn't want her to relapse. She just hadn't had a drink since she was 16. And so, I, but I thought if she had a drink, we'd have more fun because I couldn't drink. So I was trying to make her drink. And then we were in Emerald Lagasse's brand new restaurant. And we're on our first date as a newly married couple. And I should be looking at her and I should be staring in her eyes. But I have, I have addiction has turned totally. My mind is thinking about me. I'm selfish. I'm self-seeking. And so instead of looking at her, instead of looking at her, Rachel, I'm looking at me like through the mirror. Like, I look good. I mean, she got such a great catch. And, I, and, and, and I'm having like, like a mental illness thing. And then, the, the, and then in the next table, in the next table, something happens I've never seen before. They serve wine in a decanter and no one's drinking it and I had not seen this before and there was a like a like it was like a bong it was like a wine bong and and and, and I'm 25 I'm, I'm I'm 25 years old and I or 23 40 years old and I call the food server over and I go what is going on at the table next to us and she says they're drinking fine wine that needs to breathe first yeah yeah yeah, yeah, Kaylee, have you ever seen that fine wine that needs a... Me neither, I've never seen it. And I said to myself, that's the problem. I went straight from Mad Dog 2020 to crack, and I miss fine wine that needed to breathe first. <laughs> if I would have just stopped at fine wine that needed to breathe first, I wouldn't have to be sober. I could just drink wine and talk about it and swish it around and smell it and get an attache case, and I could walk around and be respectable, and I, can, and I could do respectable things, and I wouldn't have to go to AA, which is such a waste of my time because I'm not even an alcoholic. And if you don't believe you're an alcoholic, or if you don't, excuse me, if you don't believe you're powerless over your addiction, you're definitely going to use it again. I just want to say, if you think you're powerful over, like, like, like I know people that think they're powerful over one drug. I'm not going to mention any of the drugs, I promise. But I'm saying they think they're powerful over one of the drugs. And they think they could just do that once. That's not me. I'm, not, I'm powerless over my addiction. And my life becomes unmanageable. I was powerless over me before I picked up. I'm certainly not going to be uh, powerful when I, after I'm using. <laughs> And so I decided that day that I was going to drink again. I'm seven years clean. I go back to, to Alcoholics Anonymous in Fort Lauderdale, and I try to drink. 
the moment I take my first drink after seven years, from 25 to 31, I grew up in AA. I grew up in NA. I was sober for all these years. I, ma I'm, I married sober. I bought a home sober. The moment I took my first drink after seven years, everything changed within one drink. And I had developed some junky superpowers. I had remembered that I had Xanax, which I didn't even know what they were. I just knew that they had a label on the bottle that said, don't take with alcohol. So I didn't because I wasn't drinking and I was sober in AA. But I had it for a medical condition for a very, very short amount of time. And so I, I took it for the short amount of time and then I put it back in the medicine closet and I never used it again. The moment I took that drink, it was like, ooh, ooh. And I remembered there was like five things back behind like the shaving cream and like in the top floor. I took a drink, I went to the drugs within the same night. It turns out it does not matter what I do. I am powerless over any substance that I put in my body that affects me from the neck up. Neck down, neck up, both. <laughs> really both. <laughs> With a year and a half, within a year and a half, I had tried drugs that I had never tried before in my life because I could, because I was not broke. And I, and I was suffering, uh, before I went into any hard drugs, I was just doing the alcohol and the, and the Xanax and I was still going to AA because those are the people I knew. I wasn't drinking going to the NA, NA, that would be disrespectful. I was just taking Xanax. <laughs> I would never do that. That'd be disrespectful. So I'd just take Xanax before I go to the meetings and I'd be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> People taking me outside saying, you really, you know, you really shouldn't come to the meeting in this condition. I go, what condition? I don't even know. <laughs> and the God-sized hole got bigger and bigger and bigger and deeper. And my friend who was a photographer, he was taking, me um, he was taking, uh, uh, what's it, love drug? Thanks. Yeah, I knew you would know. And, uh, <laughs> and so he goes, see, he goes, what you need is you need to take ecstasy. And I go, why? What, what's, what's up with the ecstasy? He goes, because you're always upset. You're always very tense. You, and all you just take ecstasy, and then you're going to become loving, and you're going to have a great night out, and the whole night is about love, and, we, and, we, and there's lights and all that kind of stuff. And I said, that sounds nice. That's nice. That doesn't sound like drug addiction. I'm used to like doing drugs, going in a basement, picking at the carpet, rolling myself up in a carpet. <laughs> rolling myself up in a carpet because I think that's a great hiding place, and the police can't find me. The drugs I use... I smoke them and then I, and I find a couch and I hide behind your couch like for hours until the police are gone. My drug is not fun, but your drug is like lights and you guys, Ugh. so I tried it. But I'm an addict, so I couldn't just do one. I was like, give me everything. And, I, and I'm, like, I'm like bouncing up and down the entire... And I couldn't, I'm 34 years old, I'm bouncing like for an... That's not a, that's not a drug for a 34-year-old to just be bouncing for 12 hours straight. And I have spine issues to begin with, and I'm just like bouncing. I never got to the love part. I couldn't come down from the bouncing. <laughs> and so I would go to work so tired in the morning and so shot out, and I don't know, you can't really see me because, but if you get to see me later, one of my eyes is closed, and one of my eyes looks wherever it wants to look, and it's just, I, I have no control of it, so can you imagine after eight hours of bouncing? <laughs> That's not a good look. So I'm, I'm at work, and my hairstylist comes over to me, he goes, he goes, Stevie, he goes, he goes, honey, what's wrong with you? I go, I say, listen, I'm, I am shot out. I was using drug, I was using ecstasy all night. He goes, honey, all you need is a little Tina. And I go, I go, what, what's Tina? I go, hold on a second, because he, because he takes out a bag that looks like cocaine. And I don't know what it is, but I tell him. Now you have to say something. I'm using ecstasy. I'm using uh, Xanax, and I'm drinking. And I tell him, listen, I, have, I used to have a problem with cocaine. I cannot do cocaine. <laughs> I swear to you, I said it. I said it just like that. I cannot do cocaine. That better not be cocaine. He goes, honey, this is not cocaine. This is Tina. And he takes his little cute fingernail and puts it in the Tina bag, puts his little Tina right in my nose. And I go, wow, that's amazing. And, uh, and that Tina... That really kicked my tush, and for six months I was strung out, and, and that Tina became Ike, and I was beat up all over town. 
And it, it, was, it was real bad. And that turned out to be crystal meth. That was the name that they used. Uh, and it sounds real sweet, but it's not sweet. It's a very, very serious thing. And, and, and when I got into it, nobody was doing it in, in uh, Florida except in the, uh, in the nightclubs. And uh, so that's not, you, it's really not a good thing to get into a drug that you can't get. Um, so that, that was <laughs> yeah, not one of my better moves, I just want to tell you. Um, so, so now I'm completely, you never did uh, crystal meth, right, Henry? It's terrible. It's a terrible thing. Don't do it. It's terrible. And, um, and it changes everything. Crystal meth changes everything. It changes your perception, you, you, the way you look at things. You, 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 nobody, can t nobody could touch me anymore. My, 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 my skin got shot out. My, my nervous system got shot out. My brain got shot out. It was something I'd never experienced before. And the, and the loneliness and despair, only that you could know in that dark pit that was, that's created by the devil himself. And I was all alone. And I, and I went to a, a therapist, and I couldn't tell them that I was using that. And so they diagnosed me with a very serious disorder. But it really was crystal meth disorder. But <laughs> I really could have started with that. You know, I was just tell Dr. Vitale, I just want to let you know I'm doing crystal meth. They would be like, okay, stop. You know, that would have been easy. <laughs> so they, so um, that started on my journey of psychiatric centers. That started on my journey of my wife just having enough. Uh, not knowing that I was doing drugs, so she had to serve me with a restraining order to get me out of the house. Um, and then she served me with a divorce papers, which she's never come from a family of divorce. Uh, but she went, I don't know if Russell had anything to do with that at the time. Um, but uh, she got divorce papers, and, and she didn't serve me with them. She just had them there. And she put me out in a recovery house, a halfway house. And, uh, and it, it was the lowest time of my life, lowest time of my life. We just got married. I just had seven years. I owned a full house a couple months ago. Now I'm in a halfway house. And, uh, and it, it, it was, it was a, like a shock. It was like a shock. Right. And, um, and uh, then I called up my sponsor, my previous sponsor, Jerry Bear. And I said, um, I, said I, I want to tell you, I relapsed. He says to me, shocking. That's what he says to me, shocking. He said, we, we all knew you were going to relapse. And um, I went to this treatment center in Miami and I started to go to this state. You would take us in the druggy buggy to, to see speakers. And, uh, and, I, and I went uh, in this van, and I, and I heard this speaker by the name of Russell Spatz, who happens to be here today. It was something I never heard before in my entire life. He talked about God in a way that I had never heard. I had been in Alcoholics Anonymous seven years, and I made up a God of my misunderstanding, a God that I could take into strip clubs, a God that I can, I can gamble, a God that I can punch people in the throat, a God that I wasn't faithful to my girlfriend, who then turned out to be my wife. I, I, I had made up a God of my misunderstanding. Russell spoke about the creator of the universe out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and my eye, I was going to say my eyes, but my eye was opened up. <laughs> And, and I was like, I was like, wow, there, there's, there's, there's God and he's got a first name and, and I don't have to recreate him. He's already there. That's the God of the big book. That's the God of Bill Wilson. That's the God of Henrietta. My, the Lord has been so wonderful to me. I just want to keep telling people about it. That's in, uh, the, uh, in uh, Dr. Bob's story, I believe. Um, and, and, and there's a real God out there that I haven't been tapping into. I've been giving him 30 seconds in the morning on my knees and 30 seconds at night, but I haven't been giving him my day. I haven't been doing anything with him. I'm expecting my life to be incredible, and I'm, I'm take back my own will the entire time. And here I am still burping up crack. I just lost my license. I have a six felony car crash. And with a one day of sobriety, this man spoke to my soul that I, I'll, I will never forget him. I've been following him ever since. He spoke to my soul and, and talked about the God, the creator of the universe, God, for me. I'm saying for me. And it changed everything for me. And the scales fell off my eyes, and I started following him around, and I started listening to people. That's why when I met Tina and George, I was like in love with Tina. She's told her story. I, had, I made a beeline to her, and it looked like I was a stalker. Because, see, we, we, we talk, we, when, when, when you meet God, when you meet God, you can't just be like, hey, it's like you want to tell everybody about it, whether you're annoying or not. It's, you, you want to just, it's so incredible. And I started following him around. And, um, and my life got a little bit better, but then it got really, really worse, and it got a little bit better, and it got really, really worse, and I wanted to get high, and so I decided I was going to get high. And, um, but I came up with a plan, because I thought I had developed some type of junky superpower, because I was in a halfway house, and I had about 30 days clean, you know what I'm saying? And I was showering, and I was like brushing my teeth, and I had been eating, so I was like, I really could probably get away with one more. So I came up with this plan, and I called up my wife, and who had a restraining order against me, and I said to her, I said, sweetheart, right there, she knew I was going to pull something. I said, sweetheart, could I get $199 for a cell phone 
It was a, uh, it was a cell phone that cost that much money. And I gave her the reasons why. And she put me on hold. And any time she had ever put me on hold, I, I, I had her. So I knew I had her. But she had joined Al-Anon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just want to let you know, if you're in this thing and you're having relationship issues and your family member goes to Al-Anon, you're screwed. Just want to just tell you. Just want to tell you, you're screwed. Okay? So she calls her sponsor. I'm on the phone waiting. Her sponsor says, give him the money. Give him the money. Let's find out now with a month of sobriety if we're going to push the divorce papers through. And they set me up. I don't even think that's legal in Allen. I don't know if there's people here from that. That's not even legal. They give me the $199. And I'm, I'm like a crack addict with 30 days with $199. What do you think I'm going to do with that? So I come up with a plan. But guess what I was doing? I was on my knees and I was asking God to keep me clean and sober because that's what I had been programmed to do. So inside, I'm praying. But I get up and I decide I'm going to get high because that's bad, Steve. He's going to take over. He's going to do it. But God didn't care. And I went, to this, I went to the cell phone store and I say to the guy behind the counter, I need to have the cheapest cell phone you have in here. And he says to me, Stevie B, welcome back. I was at the Victory AA meeting you were at yesterday morning. We've been waiting for you to come back. The guy behind the cell phone counter is a guy from Alcoholics Anonymous. And so God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. I wasn't believing in him, but he believed in me. Came to believe that. Yeah, yeah. Came to believe that a power greater than yourself could restore your sanity. It's not always doing the steps on paper. It's like you live the steps and then all of a sudden you're like, wow, that was a God moment. Let, let me tell you something, Crow. I've only been to Milwaukee twice because Henry and Andre invited me. And I love it. I love Milwaukee. But I don't think me and my sponsor hang out here in Milwaukee because we don't. We've been, I've been here once, twice. He gets asked to speak this weekend, my sponsor that's sitting there, Russell Spax, at a meeting that's right down the street called the uh, Primary Purpose Group on the same exact weekend that I'm here speaking at the DAA conference in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, of all the cities and all the time and all the places that he could be speaking just right down the street. You think God's just like hanging around going, I don't have any power. I can't do anything. It's not going to work out. I'm not going to help you. You'll have to figure it out. No, he's the creator of the universe. So here I am. I'm at the Sprint store. He saves me from getting high. The guy buys me a cup of coffee. I get about 11 months. My wife invites me to come back into the big bed. I get out of the halfway house, which is amazing. <laughs> I go back to our house and I come up with the idea because every single time you're about to make a breakthrough, I just want to let you know, the disease, the enemy, whatever you want to call it, is going to be there to try to make sure that you don't get to the next place in your life. The enemy knows you, the disease knows you and wants to discourage you and wants to dissuade you and you can't do it and it's never going to happen and you're not enough and I want to tell you it's all a lie from the pit of hell. It's, it's a lie. It's a lie from our disease. And I go to the house and I decide to turn my mattress over because I hadn't lived there for 11 months. And when I turn the mattress, first day in the house, my wife is downstairs and she's making breakfast and, and I'm on my knees thanking God for bringing me back from the gates of death. Thank you, God, for another day sober. Please keep me sober. Please have me be a maximum service to addicts uh, during the day. Help me to do your will. And I turn the mattress over and there they are. There's my drugs. And my, there's my drugs and my drug accomplices right there in, in between my mattress. But I had just gotten up off my knees. And good Steve was winning. And I called my wife. And she was crying and I was crying because I was crying because I found out that I was really in this thing. That I didn't have to, I didn't have to do drugs just because they're there. When I'm with God, I'm in the majority. I don't have to just pick up because they're there. Yeah. And we get the drugs and we get them out of the house and, and, and life is good and we get two years and three years and I'm starting meetings and I'm, uh, uh, the, the, the big book says that we go, some, of us, some of us go back to the religions of our youth and I didn't go back to the religion of my youth but I went back to religion and, I, and I, I started following Russell around and I'm going to God meetings and I'm going to church and I'm going to all different things and life is good and, um, and I, I just want to tell you I'm a very, very satisfied, satisfied customer of the, of the programs and, um, and then we wanted to have a baby. 
And because so I'm like nine years clean, I'm nine years sober, nine years clean. And uh, it's a little tough to get the different phrases. I, you just got to do the best you can. And, um, and uh, you guys will see. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm nine years clean, right? And, I, and we want to have a baby. And, and so and we just figured we're just going to have a baby like everyone has a baby and we can't have a baby. And we, and we don't understand it. We can't have a baby. So we go to an in vitro fertilization clinic and... and um, and we, and we go to South America to her family. We get eggs donated. And then we hire a surrogate. You, you always get a baby with a surrogate. That's their job. <laughs> Not us. It didn't work with a surrogate. And then we get pregnant. No, I'm not, it wasn't exactly in that order, but we get pregnant. And, we're, and it's incredible. We build the baby room in the house, and everything's amazing. And, and we're just you know, walking on air, and, and, then, and then we lose the baby. And, and, I, and I didn't see it coming because I'm nine years clean and I'm sponsoring men and I'm going to church and I'm taking meetings into treatment centers and I'm doing everything you guys told me to do. I think you were a part of my life during that time, though, and I'm not sure. And, um, and I'm broken. We got a baby room built. My wife's broken. I'm broken. I don't see it coming. Well-meaning people in the program told me that God only gives you what you can handle. Please don't ever believe that. That's not true. It's not that one person can handle a baby dying and another person only can handle losing a job. It's life gives you some really, really tough things and God's going to give you the strength to get through it. That's true. Yeah. And he did. He gave us the strength to get through it, but it was very, very tired. It was a very, very sad time in our, in our lives. And then we, we signed up for an adoption agency and that was a blessing. And then the adoption agency calls and says that you cannot adopt in the state of Florida. A man like you, Steve can never adopt in the state of Florida because when I was in Alcoholics Anonymous before during those seven years, I had picked up a prostitute coming out of a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. That's the type of guy I was. And that prostitute was a police officer. I don't know if that has the same rules here, but that's no good. <laughs> no, no good. And so I can't adopt in the state of Florida. And my wife, my wife didn't know that. She didn't know that while we were dating, I had went to go pick up a prostitute and I was arrested for that. And then she found out at the adoption agency. Some people laugh at that, which is very strange. Other people understand how serious that was. It's a very different group, this group. Um, so we can't have a baby and we also can't adopt. And, uh, but I want to tell you, in the programs, there's, there's the most incredible experts in the program, all different fields, right in here, all different fields. And I know an attorney, my, my sponsor's an attorney, my friend uh, Happy Bob was an attorney, he got caught with two kilos, so well, he was a good attorney at one time. Um, but he knew people that knew people, and we called up Happy Bob, and he told me about a woman, a Jewish woman by the name of Mindy, that was, would possibly come to our house and give us a home study. And so we called up Minnie, and she, and she made an appointment to come give us a home study. But by now, by now, we're like over-the-top Christians. We're like T-shirt Christians. We're bumper sticker Christians. We're <laughs> statue Christians. We're giant Jesus Christians. We're, we, got, we have a giant Jesus painting. We got St. Francis. We got, a whole, we got waters. We got fountains. And, you know, and, and like she's going to do a surprise visit tomorrow. That's a lot of taking down a lot of stuff. For Jewish Mindy to come to our house. And so I say to, I say to my wife, listen, we're not going to be able to take it all down, but at least let's take giant Jesus down because that, that's going to be like the biggest one right there. And my wife says this. She says, uh, we're not going to change who we are. If it's God's will, we'll have a baby. And if it's not, we won't. And she didn't give up on me, even though I was a terrible person in my previous sobriety. And Mindy came, and she looked at all the stuff, and she read my testimony. She saw six felony uh, drug charges. She saw uh, picking up the prostitute, and she said, do you think God gave you another chance? And I said, I know he did. She said, so how can I, give you, how can I not give you another chance? And she signed off. And, that, and that's a great part of the story, but if you know anything about adoption, now you get in a very, very, very long line. Even though there's thousands of babies out there, they make it so hard for the people to get babies. And so now we get in a very long line, and now I'm already 43, my wife is 42, and on paper, it's not like we look stellar, it's not a stellar resume for someone to pick us, but God didn't look at the resume, and God had this beautiful woman uh, in this part of the country by California, um, I'm talking about the northern part of the country by California, and she picked us to come up and see her baby, 
And uh, we come up on day one, and there's this beautiful white baby. You, you guys grow some very white, white babies. <laughs> and, um, and we look at this baby, and, and, and she holds up, and she says, what would you like to name your son? And we say, Joshua. And she says, why Joshua? We say in the Bible, uh, Joshua 24, 15 says, for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. And she says, well, I'm not religious. I said, well, I just want to let you know what that means is that your son, our son, is going to grow up in a godly home and, 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 and hopefully never going to see drinking or drugging and hopefully never going to see fighting and cursing and hopefully he's going to be, grow up in a home where we choose God first. And she said, that's, that's going to be great. And two weeks later, we came home with Joshua. And there was people from the program on our lawn, and they had signs. They say, welcome home, Joshua. They taught us how to raise Joshua. They gave us baby showers. People in the program gave us baby showers, and they gave us clothes. And I took them to all the meetings because now I'm 43, and all I know is the program. And, and you know, and I'm, I got him in the sack, you know, the sack. And, and, he's, and he goes to meetings with me. And, and when he's about nine months uh, old, just want to show you something, how incredible God is. Uh, because he wants to bless us, but he also puts cherries on the, on the Sunday. Uh, like we, we were all on a plane, all just came, oh, a bunch of us were on the plane, the, the speakers uh, tomorrow and, and Sunday. Uh, she was on the same plane, and my friend Cody, he got on the same plane, and my sponsor speaking in the same town. These are little cherries that God puts on the Sunday of the story, so that when you tell the story, it's like it's, it can only be him. I mean, it can only be him. So at nine months, my son springs out, my little white, white, when I, the reason I'm saying white is because my wife is from Colombia, and, and you know, I'm, I'm an Italian from New York, and, and he's like super white. <laughs> like three forms of identification to pick him up at the, uh, at the nursery, like that type, right? And at nine months, he springs out the most gorgeous red hair, and he looks exactly who does he look like? Exactly like my like your mother. Exactly like my mother. Those people that know my mother, he's the exact twin of my mother. And then he springs out the exact beautiful nose as my mother. And then he springs out the exact freckles of all his cousins, of his three cousins. And he springs out the exact face of the entire family, except for me and my wife. And, <laughs> and that, that's, just one of, that's the cherry on the Sunday that God's like, listen, listen, you did a lot of bad stuff, but I'm, and, and you couldn't have a baby. But, and the state of Florida says you can't adopt it. He said, but I'm not listening to the state of Florida. And I'm not listening to the people that say you can't. I want you to know you can. I want you to know that with my plan that everything is going to work out. Continue to go to meetings. Continue to trust me. Help others. Clean house. Don't give up on this. Times are going to get tough, and you're going to continue to go through it. Follow the people that forged this before you. You don't have to make, you don't have to make it. You don't have to recreate it. If you want to do something cutting edge and start a new program and be part of a new program, you got it. You can do that because we have the 12 steps that was created by God during 1935 and 1939, and that's the framework for the magic that we have here. So don't worry about it. It's all going to work out as long as you follow that nothing that you have to do is going to do anything to get in the way of that as long as you follow what has already been done before you you see people will come into the program and they'll settle at clean they'll settle for clean they'll settle for sober they'll settle for clean you'll meet people in the programs and and, and they're 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 25 years clean the the 35 years clean they're they're the 30 years sober and they'll settle for sober but i, I don't, i'm not going to settle for sober because the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about the, the fourth dimension of existence. And, and people that believe in the fourth dimension of existence, we know who we are, right? We know who we are because we're like, yeah, what's up? What's up? <laughs> we're not just going to settle for sober. We're not going to just settle for clean because we want a life beyond our wildest dreams. Settling for just clean is like going to a buffet that has all the greatest foods, has cracked crab, lobster, prime rib, Everything you've ever wanted and you go to the salad area and you grab a crouton and you put a crouton in your plate and you get your fork and you get your knife and you're settling for, how you doing? I'm just hanging in there. <laughs> I'm, I'm clean, one day at a time, clean, one day at a time, clean. <laughs> and then you're looking down the, the row and there's people with stuff all over them and they're just having a great time and we're just having a life beyond them. I met this woman today I forgot your first name she did a dance she said my name is Tina so is my sponsor and she just started dancing another woman from, uh, from uh, New Orleans I think it was New Orleans she, she twerked and put her tush out uh, we're not going to settle for clean when we can have when we can have a life beyond our wildest dreams don't settle for the crouton don't settle for the crouton God wants to bless us with everything. That's it. That's it. 
That's all I got. That's it. That's what I got. You, is that good? Yes. I mean, yeah.